Okay, we're uh, delighted to have uh, Christina Bach give us uh, this year's lecture uh, under the title, Advancing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda for Transformational Change. And I think it would be best to talk a little bit about um, the Catherine Knowles Women International Affairs and in particular about Catherine Knowles. Um, on September 18th, uh, Catherine, our, our beloved uh, alumna and accomplished member of the CIS Europe Leadership Team uh, and friend to many of us passed away after brief uh, illness with a rare and aggressive form of cancer. Um, Catherine loved working with students and excelled at it in her role as Associate Director of European and Europe, Eurasian Studies, leading study trips around the world, helping students to select the perfect sequence of courses uh, or coaching them to secure top internships. Um, she challenged students to dream big and took satisfaction in championing them to accomplish their goals. Uh, as Director of Public Affairs, she worked tirelessly to promote SICE Europe as a premier destination for, for the study of international relations. She helped to further strengthen the global reputation of the school in myriad ways, um, orchestrating events with high profile speakers, uh, refining admissions uh, material to, to attract top students and uh, in myriad other ways. Um, so, this uh, Catherine knows uh, intern. There's a Catherine knows internship fund that has been established to commemorate the invaluable personal and professional contributions uh, she made uh, to the SICE Europe community. Now, to Christina Bosch's uh, professional interest uh, in responsible business practices, uh, livelihood security of vulnerable groups, forced migration, and the meaningful inclusion of women in fragile and conflict-affected environments are informed by her upbringing in an American military family in Texas, uh, which is still part of the United States, but has its own sort of, uh, shall we say, foreign policy. Uh, her experience traveling and working in Central America, Europe, the Middle East, uh, North Africa, Turkey, and the United States further shaped her understanding of the frameworks necessary to ensure people can live in, uh, in, in dignity and free from fear and want. Um, Christina has held leadership roles in crucial stakeholder initiatives, such as serving as chair of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education, uh, Working Group on Business for Peace, uh, and as co-chair of the International Crisis Group's Ambassador Council. Uh, she has advised the European Parliament, uh, political parties in Europe, uh, international organizations, and development aid uh, organizations in the fields of development cooperation, and humanitarian assistance, uh, including women's meaningful inclusion and peace and uh, peace in peace. Um, currently, she is research affiliate at Queen's University and an adjunct faculty member at the Brussels School of Governance. Uh, previously, she was a visiting fellow at LSE, uh, uh, IDEAS, uh, and a visiting fellow uh, with the uh, Martin, the Wil Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies. Uh, and she received her PhD in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick. Um, I think that you'll agree with me that uh, there is no one better to address this topic uh, than Christina. Uh, and so we're so happy that you could accept our uh, invitation to, to, give this, to give this lecture. So um, it would be great if um, you could you know, limit your presentation to 30, 40 minutes, then we can open up the Q&A. Um, anyone who is on... Um, online, if you can, as uh, is our tradition, uh, if you could uh, ask your questions in the Q&A box, um, I'll uh, read them to her um, as after she gives her presentation. So anyway, over to you, Christina. Great. Well, thank you so much to uh, Professor Plummer uh, and also to Alessandra um, for the support uh, and, and for welcoming me here. Um, I also had the fortunate opportunity to meet with some of the students uh, beforehand, uh, which I always uh, enjoy doing. Um, and I also have to say it's, it's a privilege to be here um, to keep uh, Catherine's uh, legacy uh, going. It sounds as if uh, she was an exquisite woman, uh, someone you'd be privileged uh, to know and to especially have called a friend. Um, yes. My topic is advancing the women, peace and security agenda for transformational change. Um, there are three uh, main elements to my remarks. 
Um, the first is to uh, challenge uh, traditional peace and security perspectives that often dominate the international arena in addressing issues related to fragility and armed conflict. The second is to highlight uh, why we need to advance the women, peace and security agenda, agenda for greater gender equality uh, and equity uh, and to deepen women's meaningful inclusion where women have decision-making authority across all spheres of society. And the third is to demonstrate how women's economic inclusion uh, is a critical avenue uh, for transformational change in our societies and what business uh, can do to make that a reality. Um, so to kick off, um, I'd like to ask you all to think about um, the words peace and security. Um, what comes to mind uh, when you think of them? Um, are there any experiences uh, that you may uh, like to share? Um, are there any current events <laughs> that come to mind when you think about peace and security? <laughs> so really just off the cusp, um, I know students I talked about this, about what their perceptions or perspectives are on peace and security, but I think it's very important to kind of frame our uh, presentation and remarks and discussion because uh, oftentimes uh, each of us have very different notions of what we what we think of or what we feel uh, are the indicators of peace and security. So anyone want to start off? Yeah. Sorry, I'm thinking about the Ukraine crisis and there are different concepts of security involved. There's the security of the nation state, but there's also the sense of security for the different populations. And I guess, and I'm guessing, uh, different people have different concepts of what security means. No? It's one thing, the insecurity for um, male soldiers. It's another thing for, I don't know, grandmothers who can't do the shopping because they might get shot by a sniper. I, I, question mark. I mean, I don't know. I suppose what we're looking at is the different perceptions of that when one has the absolute state of insecurity that's war, then different categories of people perceive and uh, interpret their personal security in different ways. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How about any of the students? I already know they have some ideas <laughs> and thoughts. Either of you want to share? So when I think of security, I think of military security as well as mainly border security and who's coming in, who's coming out. How are we protecting um, our citizens? And how about with regards to peace? Anybody else have any ideas that come to mind? Um, I would say that it could also be more basic security, like I'm thinking about food security or if it's scarcity, I mean, that's definitely, I mean, as much as border security, but this is probably more directly attaching all the people in, in the sense of not really having the basic need that they just are used to normally have. I think this is very disrupting. And I'm thinking about Ukraine. I mean, like one day you are, I mean, obviously with some security issues since probably 2014 are like very clear, but food security was something that was there. And then one day just like was gone or just basic security in the sense of shelter, housing. I think this is very, and for me, it's very hard to think. Security with uh, you know, security from um, oppressive governments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of Myanmar, and they, you know, the mm -hmm. government coup didn't cross borders, but it obviously really created a great deal of insecurity at all levels. Uh, you know, from economic to you know freedom of expression, and well, didn't exist that much before. But um, it's a, it seems to me to be a very broad concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here. Um... On this slide, um, we have a, a diagram that kind of uh, introduces the two um, kind of dominant perspectives on peace. Um, 
we have on the one hand the negative peace paradigm, which uh, refers to an absence of or even the absence of the threat um, of physical or direct violence. Um, so, for instance, when um, a ceasefire is enacted, um, the idea is that a negative peace will ensue um, because something undesirable, something undesirable that is physical, has stopped happening, uh, such as violence or um, oppression. And then you can see on the other side, um, we have the positive peace paradigm, which is um, framed by an absence of structural violence. Um, so positive peace is uh, filled with positive content, such as the restoration of relationships, um, creating social systems uh, that serve the needs of the whole population uh, and the constructive resolution of conflict. Um, so um, the father of peace research, Johann Galtung, um, kind of argues that a positive peace is the integration of, of human society. Um, so peace does not necessarily mean the total absence of any conflict. Um, in fact, conflict is often a, an important factor in the development of societies because it means that um, people from very different social economic backgrounds, for instance, um, come together in a collaborative manner um, for the development of, of their society. But peace means the absence of violence in all forms, so both direct and indirect uh, violence. Um, and the unfolding of conflict uh, is addressed constructively. Um, similarly, uh, to the importance of understanding the different peace paradigms or different perspectives on peace, um, I wanted to share with you two of the dominant um, security paradigms that often um, are showcased in the inter international arena when it comes to addressing issues related to uh, fragility and armed conflict. Um, so here you have uh, the traditional or national security paradigm, uh, which refers to a realist construct of security in which the referent object of security is the state. Um, traditional security perspectives um, tend to prioritize defense um, and military issues to promote regime stability um, and affirm state positions uh, and interests. Whereas you can see here, the human security paradigm uh, proposes um, an alternative way of pursuing peace and security, uh, taking people and their experiences um, as a critical uh, reference point. So human security broadens the concept of security and stipulates that all individuals um, are entitled to freedom from fear, freedom from want, um, and freedom to live in dignity. So human security reflects positive peace because of the emphasis on uh, global justice and structural reform, um, whereas in contrast, traditional security entrenches, entrenches negative peace uh, by underscoring military power to justify stability. So nevertheless, security can be considered a public good, right? Because individuals need to live in a physically safe environment. Um, but this is something I think that can be uh, obtained collaboratively uh, in consultation with various actors, um, including the state. Um, and again, I would just emphasize that I think it's important um, for us to understand these different uh, peace and security perspectives, because I think we oftentimes find ourselves uh, working among people who share the same perspective, um, same interest, uh, same approaches to addressing issues related to peace and security. And I think that's, that's one of our major challenges um, to the state of world affairs um, as we see it now. So I think the more that we can do to broaden our understanding um, of peace, different peace and security paradigms, and the more that we can um, open up to collaborating with different uh, perspectives or with people who have different perspectives, I think all the better. Um, and then I'd like to move on to the kind of second uh, element of my remarks today, and that is with regards to the Women, uh, Peace and Security agenda. Um, so we know by now that our war, armed conflict and crisis uh, often affect women and men differently. Um, conversely, women and men do not always participate in the same way in conflicts, um, either in prevention um, or resolution processes. While men are more often directly involved in armed conflict, either as soldiers or armed combatants, women often feel the impact of armed conflicts 
indirectly due to complex and unsafe conditions caused by war and also directly as civilian uh, victims slash survivors. In addition, women are often affected by conflict much longer than men. Um, they are rarely given decision-making roles in formal peace talks and preparations for post-conflict reconstruction, although they feel and experience the consequences of those decisions. As a result, their specific needs are not heard or considered. Moreover, the consequences of sexual violence uh, during conflict situations, such as loss of honor and exclusion from their communities, forced pregnancy and health problems, do not end when the conflict ends. In fact, sexual and gender-based violence often continues or even intensifies after the cessation of war. In recognition of the gendered consequences of violence and armed conflict in the year 2000, the UN Security Council uh, passed Resolution 1325, focusing on women's full participation in conflict prevention, peace building and post-conflict uh, recovery processes. And what is now known as the Women, Peace and Security Agenda or the WPS Agenda is comprised of multiple resolutions. Overall, the agenda aims to improve the situation of women and girls in conflict and post-conflict situations, including through the promotion of gender equality uh, and the human rights of women and girls, the prevention and protection against violence against women and girls, and the participation of women in decision-making in the field of peace and security. So for example, in peace negotiations and post-conflict reconstruction talks. The WPS agenda is implemented by member states of UN, UN itself, uh, different uh, regional organizations, uh, including NATO and the EU uh, and the OSCE. And in 2004, to ensure the concrete implementation of the WPS agenda, UN Security Council called on all member states to enact national action plans um, that would help also to uh, be able to evaluate the progress of states in their implementation of the WPS agenda. And what we have seen is a variety of kind of developments of national action plans, anywhere from governments taking the lead. Um, so you have Sweden, of course, which is well known for their um, you know, so-called feminist foreign policy. Um, the US itself has also um, led the implement or led the development of a national action plan. And then in other situations, you have civil society organizations um, such as the Women in Foreign Policy uh, Turkey chapter that led the writing of a national action plan because the government um, still up to now has failed to do so in hopes that the state would incorporate um, the findings of their study. Um, we have also seen mounting pressure for the private sector to see itself as a vital stakeholder in the development of inclusive uh, societies. And through incorporating guidance as set out in the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact, the UN Guiding Principles on hum Business and Human Rights, uh, the Women's Economic Principles, and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, companies can boost uh, their contributions to the women, peace and security agenda uh, by going beyond do no harm approaches and uh, enacting uh, further strategies uh, within their operations to do so. I would argue that business is uniquely positioned to disrupt gender-based constraints and patriarchal cultures that impede women's agency, particularly in fragile and conflict affected environments, um, which often lag in fair labor legislation and progressive company policies. More specifically, the private sector can bolster women's economic inclusion by easing the transition and retention of women in the labor market. I think here it's important to understand um, what we mean um, by um, economic inclusion. Um, the UN's definition is, is kind of the one guiding de definition that many of us working in this space uh, utilize. Um, and that is the idea to focus on how women's, on whether women's ability to participate equally in existing markets um, exist and to what degree, um, whether or not women have access to and control over productive resources, assets, and savings. This shift here so you can see it a little bit better. Um, whether or not they have access to decent and dignified work. Um, whether or not they have control over their own time, lives, and bodies, 
Um, and then lastly, um, whether they have an, an increased voice, agency, and uh, meaningful participation, um, specifically in, in economic uh, decision making at all levels from the household um, to international institutions. Um, more practically speaking, to bolster women's economic inclusion, business uh, needs to be aware of gender based constraints. Um, they need to go beyond social investments and corporate social responsibility initiatives um, and commit real and tangible resources and institute policies um, such as the ones, excuse me, uh, uh, in this table. So you can look at the, the table and to see uh, the different um, ways companies uh, can enact resources and policies to help ease the transition and retention of women in the labor market. And I'd be curious um, to hear if you feel like there's any um, that you know of or can think of that are not on this table. Um, we can see that flexible um, working hours, work-life integration, childcare facilities, uh, paid parental leave for parents, uh, well-being uh, plans, time off for care work, um, so not only for child care, but the broader um, notion of care work, continuing education and safe modes of transportation um, are just some examples of human resource management uh, schemes that can assist the entry and retention of women in the labor market. Um, and while the private sector can play an important role in bolstering the conditions that lead to greater economic security of women, I think it's important to note that uh, women's capacity to absorb um, economic, environmental, health, and political shocks is typically less than men's, mainly due to um, structural inequalities um, and social cultural barriers. Um, I'd like to go back here. Um, women earn less um, globally still. Um, women hold less secure jobs and they are more likely to be employed in the informal sector, which means less access to social protect protections, resources, savings, and capital. Um, in a piece for LSE, Elias Corey notes that even when female labor does make its way onto official, official balance, balance sheets, it's systematically shortchanged. Women globally earn just 77 cents for every dollar a man makes. In some, some countries, the gap is much larger. And it persists even when adjusting for industry position and hours worked. Women also make up most single parent households and perform most unpaid work. In a report, Oxfam, um, I'm sure uh, you all are familiar with Oxfam, but it's a very well-known um, international uh, NGO. Um, Oxfam argues that inequality or the great divide is based on a flawed and sexist economic system that values the wealth of the privileged few, mostly men, more than the billions of hours of essential work, the unpaid and underpaid care work done primarily by women and girls around the world. Discrepancies between national laws protecting women and the enforcement of those laws can profoundly impact women's agency and economic security. In some contexts, entrenched cultural biases and archaic civil registration systems prevent women from acquiring a legal entity, at least until their male family members receive one. Without a legal uh, identity, it is difficult, if not impossible, for women to register significant life events, such as births, marriage, and divorce, and claim assets and property. Furthermore, in times of crises, the absence of formal identification can prolong the time it takes for a woman to receive humanitarian assistance or register, for instance, in protection systems. Around the world, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to threaten progress, achieving gender equality and equity. Of course, we know uh, the numbers that violence against women has increased. Um, access to sexual and reproductive health has been hampered. Um, and women have experienced disproportionate job and income losses due to their overrepresentation in low pay and lower job security sectors, such as agriculture, services, and manufacturing. In short, economic systems sustained by women and girls who are not 
compensated and valued for their contributions and capabilities severely compromise prospects for inclusive development and sustainable peace. Um, business is by no means a silver bullet to addressing inequality and equity. In fact, in many situations, the private sector has been the biggest culprit in the destruction of, of societies, the environment, and in keeping women from advancing. Um, but I think we are experiencing a critical moment where people are questioning uh, how we approach and perceive issues related to peace and security and what different stakeholders, including the private sector, can bring to the table in addressing them. Therefore, the private sector should go beyond do no harm approaches um, and integrate uh, responsible pr business practices that align with the women peace and security agenda to bolster women's economic inclusion a key component for societal transformation. And I'd like to end it there. <laughs> okay. Thanks uh, very much, Christina, for a very interesting overview of, of many issues and, um, and how uh, these questions fit into the peace and, and security dialogue. Um, why don't we uh, open it up for questions? I don't see any yet online. Mark. Okay, could you introduce yourselves? Yeah, sure. And, uh, and uh, Mark Gilbert, I teach uh, history here, also a little bit of political philosophy. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I was expecting somebody else to go first. Uh, thank you for. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. It's not exactly a critical remark, but I, but I did think there was like a, a gap uh, because you went from defining security to talking about economic security to then talking about business. But I, it wasn't clear to me uh, who, should, who would be compelling business or whether but business was being expected to do this uh, you know out of the goodness of their hearts or else alternatively uh, out of some sort of moral obligation uh, I mean it's the argument that you're making I mean your argument is clear enough but in the sense that economic security is uh, economic security and or inclusion inclusion is part of economic security for women in particular and and then you move to businesses ought to be doing. I mean, it's a classic is ought argument. Uh, but if businesses don't, who should compel them? This is my question. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of um, interesting activity that has been taking place um, within the private sector over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, the establishment of the UN Global Compact in the year 2000, which is also the year that the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, was passed, um, calls upon the private sector to adopt 10 principles um, to achieve in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they were largely focused on multi uh, national corporations, so big corporations, those who have 500. Uh, or more employees. Um, but I think you also see that there's this shift amongst consumers. Consumers expect more from the private sector. So also you see that in the, the late 90s and the early 2000s where uh, you know, we, we did see some of the multinational uh, corporations uh, like Nike, like Adidas, um, that got into a lot of uh, trouble amongst consumers for uh, working with companies in their supply chain that had children, you know, sewing soccer balls, for instance, or their sneakers. Um, I think so you can see this momentum coming from different, uh, from different angles. So you can see consumers demand more from companies uh, to do more than just making sure that they're not complicit in human rights violations, but to ensure that they are paying their employees a fair wage, um, that they are offering work-life integration schemes. And then you also see the private sector 
um, being held by these international frameworks, such as the UN Guiding Principles, um, based on the UN Global Compact. You also have a UN uh, Business and Human Rights Guiding Framework. Um, the OSCE also has their own responsible business framework. And so larger corporations uh, see that they have to do things differently. Um, then you also have on the European context, over the last year and a half, there's been a discussion in the European Parliament about passing legislation that would shift from European companies voluntarily um, focusing on uh, human rights due diligence to a mandatory, to a requirement that European companies will have to ensure that not only in their core business operations, but any companies that are involved in their supply chains are not complicit in human rights violations. So you also have this movement on a legislative basis that is forcing uh, at least larger companies um, here in the European context um, to, to do more than do no harm. Yeah. Yeah. Before, I'm sure other people want to ask other things because that, that's actually helped me express my question a little bit better. So we're talking about uh, your, your argument is primarily that uh, women's inclusion, it, we're, we're talking about what you might describe as the global south and you're arguing that we're talking of international norms being, being suggested to private business via uh, uh, pressure groups, via NGOs, via international organizations themselves, and that this is kind of now spilling over into a legislative agenda from institutions such as the European Union that is uh, capable of imposing actual legal obligations on firms. I think that was the point I was trying to get. I mean, you know, it's classic political question, who, whom, who's doing this to who? Yeah. Yeah, I would also say there's a civil society element too. So you have civil society organizations, um, uh, you know, Oxfam, the Fair Trade Movement, uh, Global Witness. Um, you have industry-based initiatives. So like the garment industry, there's a there's a major initiative, um, manufacturing brought more broadly, um, agriculture, and even in uh, amongst environmental uh, outfits are pushing for greater uh, human rights compliance. So. Yeah, and, and I think also there's, there is an understanding, I think more so that gender equality directly relates to peace and security more so than ever. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question with regard to this civil... Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, nice to meet you, I'm Georgia. I'm actually a uni Bo student, but I'm attending one course here. So, um, and I would like to ask, oh yeah, Unibo is University of Bologna. Um, yeah, I would like to ask about civil society. And like, to what extent do you believe, or I mean, is it believed that it's actually uh, more like the, I'm, I don't know, I'm thinking about the public sector or the government, or even like the big corporations that should like try to pressure also, or try to shape, we could say the civil society in terms of having women be more included themselves. Because I think that sometimes it's very hard for people and thinking about, for example, in Italy, I mean, besides the Italian culture, there are like some basic um, barriers, I think that are more pragmatic to like having women more included compared to men even like in the family um, situation, like to, to actually have women trying to privilege their career instead of men, because sometimes it's just more convenient also in terms of salary. In one of your points where is the pay gap, I mean, sometimes it's like a practical issues. Women will tend to take a step back for the family because it is more convenient than men take a step forward in terms of career. So how do you think maybe the European parliament or probably more directly the different governments can actually make a step forward in this sense. Like, do you think there is some sort of that way that they could do that? Or is that a too broad question? 
No, I think it's a great point. I'd be curious to hear what um, other folks in the room think about that, especially on the on the Italian context. Um, I suppose there's one way is right is where the state enacts certain uh, regulations, um, but I think in the absence of the state uh, enacting certain uh, you know more equitable um, policies or regulations. Um, for all entities within society to adopt and, and adhere to. I think the private sector needs to step up. Um, I think here you can see there's an interesting uh, guidance for business um, that I contributed to on women, peace and security that the UN Global Compact UK network published recently. And it, it mainly showcases um, the importance and how uh, the private sector can go beyond the state not um, providing equitable frameworks um, in place. I mean, the private sector can do simple things and it mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, you can see as we we're talking about some of the, the policies, I mean, we've been talking about these for, for decades um, and still, yeah, in, in some of even our Western societies, you know, they still persist uh, as uh, serving as barriers to, to greater gender equality. Yes, thank you. I'm Rafaela De Sarto. I'm, um, uh, what am I teaching? I'm teaching Middle Professor. East Studies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also the director of the, of the Maya program. Um, that was exactly, I mean, I, I, I tried to formulate the question in, in, I have several questions in my head. I tried to formulate them. And it's a bit of follow up of what my colleague Mark was saying. I mean, we are in 2022, right? And we still have pay gaps, we still have, I mean, all the issues that you mentioned, right? It's still there. Um, and yes, of course, I believe that civil society can make a very important contribution and legislation is needed and the, uh, the private sector can make a contribution, right? But I mean, how do you really deal with the issue of what you mentioned before, structural violence according to Galtung? Um, the culture of patriarchy, which we have in Italy, but not only, right? I mean, as far as I know, even in, in, in the Scandinavian country, you'd still have the pay gap. It's smaller, but you still have it, right? So how do you really deal with these issues? I mean, is it sufficient to have companies discuss or even having UN resolutions? Um, I don't want to be pessimistic, right? But I think that it's important to, uh, to perhaps really think um, about the structural conditions that, that, that seem to me enormous because I mean, it's obvious that nobody gives up privileges that they have, no? In this case, if we're talking about patriarchy, it's obviously why would men give up their privileges, no? Unless they're forced to, and who will force them again? Mm -hmm. And perhaps you have some examples where, because you just said, you know, it's, it's moving very, very, very slowly. Perhaps you have some examples where you can say, here, there is a risk. That was something that really happened. Really, we really went forward with that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. I can maybe touch upon um, the bulk of, of my <clears throat> research and kind of professional interest um, at the country level is um, with regards to the humanitarian consequences of the war in Syria. Um, so I did a lot of my, my work focused on uh, Syrian refugee women in Turkey and their experiences um, with the gender consequences of the war, um, their lack of economic security. We talk about, you know, the Ukraine crisis. Um, the, the state of the Republic of Turkey in 2014 enacted this temporary protection status um, that would allow uh, anyone who was granted that status to then apply for formal work permits after the labor legislation was reformed in 2016. Um, and so you have, you see this straightforward kind of framework for livelihood security, for economic inclusion. Um, but it's a very small percentage of Syrian refugees who have been granted work permits. Uh, one in, uh, barrier is that it's, it's a costly process, um, that um, the employer is the one who has to apply for the work permit. Um, so the individual, the potential employee is, is bound to that uh, future employer, which means if they're exploited or if they you know, uh, report on them for some ridiculous you know, reason to the security services, to the police, 
Um, these are issues that they think about, which is oftentimes why they don't opt for going the formal uh, employment route or the formal route into the labor market. And they would rather work informally, which means um, they don't have the work permit, but then that also means that they don't have access to retribution if they face abuse. Um, uh, it doesn't, it means that they won't, you know, be able to acquire a minimum wage. Um, but what I found in, in my interviews with um, Syrian uh, women, um, they faced not only the structural barriers to livelihood security, but they also faced these social cultural barriers where, for instance, they all of a sudden were the, the one that was the breadwinner of the family, perhaps uh, not necessarily because there wasn't a male partner, but maybe because um, that male partner or the father or the you know, cousin, male cousin was, had been injured uh, or couldn't find work uh, himself. And so women were also were thrust into these precarious situations where they had to you know, earn a livelihood um, for maybe themselves, but then also maybe their family members. But then they also faced um, family abuse um, in many situations. Um, and then they also had the double uh, discrimination uh, from maybe their employer. Um, but what's interesting to find that is that there was this sense of um, this kind of renewed or uh, sense of confidence, at least among the women that I um, you know, had the privilege of, of interviewing with. Um, and then also, not for only my research, but then I also conducted some studies for the ILO Turkey office. Um, and they, they, yeah, they demonstrated there, they expressed that they had this real like renewed sense of confidence in being able to bring home, you know, financial support. Um, but that it also came with yeah, these additional uh, challenges where that wasn't actually welcomed by everyone in the family or even the community. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, that's just one example. I think the interesting bit about the private sector for me is that I, mo most of my work has been at, at, at the uh, SME level, the small to medium-sized enterprises. I think that's where the real, real interesting shift um, takes place um, because you see the results almost instantaneously. Um, whereas at the, at the you know, multinational corporation, yeah, maybe if they do enact these kinds of policies, maybe they make you know, a much broader uh, impact on the communities that they're uh, engaging with. But I think the, the small to medium sized enterprises really kind of have this aha moment and many of them are actually already um, pursuing, I think, positive um, policies without really understanding and they're, they're contributing uh, to their communities in ways that I think multilateral corporations could could learn from because they're the ones who are um, in the community. I mean, if you know, they treat their employees badly, they, you know, their, their reputation means almost everything. Uh, and I can see that in, in Kurdistan and also in, in Egypt, it's been interesting, the, the Egyptian private sector um, by and large, not those who are aligned with the military or the, the economic element that is controlled by the military, um, but the private sector that is, I would say as, as independent as can possibly be in Egypt, they're the ones who've been pursuing uh, government reform um, to ensure you know, civil society uh, uh, can, uh, enact activities um, and also freedom of speech uh, related issues. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shannon Burton. I'm a first year um, master's of arts and international relations student here. Um, my question is um, partially similar, but looking at countries or contexts that are in transition from conflict, um, where they, um, obviously there's structural barriers, but there's also opportunity as the um, country is transitioning and it developing its private sector again. Do you see um, ways uh, and roads more of, from the international companies investing in those um, contexts um, to, implement the um, changes or do you see um, it better to come from the grassroots working with civil societies to make sure that these um, 
new standards are implemented and they to address structural changes at a time of change. Yeah, I would say both are important. I think what's also interesting is you can see um, international uh, donors, uh, not necessarily the US or European ones, but even some from the Gulf are supporting or providing funding um, to uh, economic activity at the local level. And it's not only to um, formalize informal companies, but it's also to spur economic activity, for instance, within uh, cooperatives or these informal um, like saving schemes that you'll see uh, women will partake in. Um, so I think I don't want to give the impression that I um, support private sector development for the sake of private sector development. I think I think my work has been focused on yeah private sector engagement from one perspective, but also economic activity, so all, all the different variations of economic activity that we see, especially in fragile and conflict affected environments, these informal um, kind of uh, economic schemes that you'll find uh, many uh, refugees and IDPs take part in. Thank you, Eugene Finkel. I teach political violence here at SAIS. So, so we mentioned Ukraine several times here. And you know, I want to ask you a very specific question. So based on your work, can you give us some very specific steps that private businesses can do to make the situation better in the short and the more longer terms? Like not in the abstract, but can can you tell us what exactly can and should be done? I'd be curious to, to hear uh, what your thoughts are on that. Um, but I, th I think it's a it's a time uh, it's an important time for both um, local Ukrainian companies um, to do their utmost, considering all of the challenges that they're facing, um, to align their operations along human rights standards. That's one. Um, and I think the same goes for any international companies that are engaged in Ukraine to ensure that one, they're not complicit in human rights abuses, um, and also to try and you know, look from a conflict sensitive perspective, ensuring that their operations aren't uh, enacting or instigating social tensions or even spurring armed conflict. Um, and then going from that, also align themselves, align their strategies or their operations along business uh, and human rights standards. Yeah. So that's great, but I still want to push you a bit. So yeah. what specifically can be done? Because what I heard is a lot of... The microphone. Sorry, but nothing specific. So can we talk about specifics here? Yeah, well, Ukraine is not my specialty, so I don't want to no, engage in on... Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, okay, For Western, so European companies? Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, then, yeah, there's certainly, there's, um, I mean, you, you have um, Western companies that are opening up positions, for instance, uh, for you know, refugee uh, employees to fill. Um, you also have the Ukrainian uh, business diaspora that is already establishing uh, joint activities with non-European, uh, non-Ukrainian European companies as a way to continue some sort of economic activity um, to also be able to funnel back you know, financial support to the Ukrainians who are remaining in the country. Um, yeah, it's 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 a difficult one for me to say. Uh, not that I, you know, considering I don't work on Ukraine directly in that sense. Do you have any ideas yourself <laughs> <laughs> that you'd like to share? We'll be <laughs> not on be at dinner with us. Oh, so. very good. <laughs> if if I could ask a a question. Um, I remember reading a recent publication, the OECD, uh, called Trade and Gender, some, some former colleagues of mine, and talking about the challenges that uh, women have in exporting and why do they underperform. And it sort of 
talked about a lot of bottlenecks, which would be familiar, I think, to what you're talking about with small and medium-sized enterprises, access to credit. Uh, but one thing that seemed to be key also is that it had to do with networking, which is also a problem for SMEs, but especially for women. They didn't, mm -hmm. the networking tended to, to work against them. And um, I was struck by something, I think it was Claudia Golden at, uh, Golden at uh, Harvard, who worried that, uh, you know, post-COVID, uh, that will have structures that do more remote working. And so, and more women have the intention of staying out of the workforce. And that's sort of what you assume, but that too could hurt the networking. And since network is important for promotion, these things, that this actually could end up hampering progress of women in the workforce. What do you, I'm just, I just, I'm not an expert. I just read some things that she had written. What, what do you think of that possibility and that uh, problem? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh... You know, by and large, um, in developing economies, women are confined to the informal labor market, which, as I, I mentioned, uh, really hinders uh, their long-term um, financial security. Um, and when it comes to women-led businesses on that side, um, they face enormous challenges. I mean, you know, again, it also relates to both the social cultural barriers that maybe their male Family members don't want them to even have a, you know, access to an identity, um, to a bank account. Um, and of course, there are also structural barriers to preventing women from opening a bank account uh, or owning property. Um, many, in many contexts, um, the male, uh, you know, the partner, the male partner is considered the health, you know, the head of the household and decision-making uh, with regards to economic um, factors are go through go through him. So even if you're a, 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 a woman uh, business owner uh, in, in, in formal uh, economy and you'd like to transition your business to the formal economy where you get registered and then you can access uh, uh, credit, uh, you can't do that uh, without the permission of your male partner. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, again, we talked about how do you, how do you, uh, how do you ensure transformational change, which is, uh, demonstrates or reflects greater gender equality and, and equity. I think it's, it's both at the structural, uh, legislative, you know, state level, as well as, um, exactly. Okay. Other, uh, other questions, any other questions from, uh, our, uh, students and faculty in Zoomlandia. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, sure. Like, just now, because it seems to me that we are always talking about the fact that like sometimes women are like legally prevented or like formally prevented, but even when they are actually allowed, de facto, they're actually not able or is not convenient for them to do that. So like my question is, is there any sort of incentive or like that we've been talking about private companies. So let's say, is that any actual incentives for, for example, private company to try to foster this? Because I feel like one of the main problems that we lack this today in society. And that's also back to the structure of problem that we were talking about that was mentioned before. What can we do to have this like to kind of dismantle the structure because I feel like, of course, men will not just come up one day and say that we need to help women. So we have to try to find a way to make it more convenient. I don't know if I'm thinking about like in a game theory kind of way, but I would say that it, there, there must be a way. I was thinking if you had any idea or. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think um, there there is something to be said of, of uh, multinational corporations seeing that these kinds of uh, you know, resources and policies that help not only um, uh, with the entry into the labor market, but retention of women in, in, in their labor market, in the, in the workforce, I think it, it also does good for them because it's, it's, there's less likelihood that a woman, for instance, would leave if she were to get married or if she had children if she had a better work-life integration. So there's this, there's this shift also that it used to be, I mean, even I have here a uh, work-life balance, but it gives this idea that they should somehow be equal. 
but now there's this kind of discussion um, that's really taken off during the, the last few years because of COVID that it ought, we ought to see it more of an integration of the different elements of you know, our identities. So it's not that they should all be balanced equally, but more integration. And I think companies can do a better, uh, better job at that. And, and they, they do see that not only investing in, or focusing on financial returns, but the social return can be, can be good for their, for their business also. And I think you're right. I think oftentimes companies look from a financial perspective, um, but I think if they see that also looking at how their activities and operations um, have a societal uh, implication. I think that it, I think their their minds are shifting, which is why I think we it's important that we all do our best to broaden and understand uh, how we perceive societal issues and then ways to overcoming them or addressing them. It's good for business. Yeah. Great. Last. Last. Yeah. I did have a comment, but he. I mean, it's this is it's very interesting, but it does seem to me that you're uh, leaving states out. I mean, in, in your presentation, and and I just wondered whether this is because there are large parts of the world where you will never persuade states to introduce the things that you're talking about here, and therefore are trying to work bottom up. I think that's probably I've just expressed my original point rather better in in two seconds. Uh, that seemed to me to be a takeaway. If, I, if I'm walking out of this room now, I'm taking away the idea that if we're going to have security for women, then it's got to be done bottom up via peer pressure, via companies rather than states. Is that is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't think it's necessarily one or the other because because I certainly don't think that states should be. Uh, relinquish from the, the responsibility to uh, enact certain policies that you know, would, would ensure the development of a more inclusive society. It's just that the bulk of my work has been from the private sector perspective, which is probably why it's kind of showcased much more, but I certainly think the state has a very important role to play. And of course, context matters. It's, it's hard to, to put a cookie cutter approach to each context. Because within a state, you know, the territorial confines of one state, of course, you have regions and, and other you know, municipalities, and those can can vary, you know, different vary very much so from each other. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Christina, for giving us so much uh, food for thought. Uh, and um, it was, uh, I think, very uh, interesting. I think we see from a very lively uh, conversation here. And, um, you yeah, know, I guess all that we have... Uh, left is just to Thank you. Thank you. this will give us time to, to show you the view from the balcony at sunset which is a uh, advantage